Good morning and welcome. We want to also welcome everybody turning in online later this day. Um, we're going to begin our service with the call to worship, and we start with this time as a way to respond to God's invitation for us to come gather in his presence <coughs> and direct our affections towards him. If you're able, please stand as we read together the call to worship based on Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Let us worship together this morning.
At this time, I'm going to invite Pastor David to lead us in a time of renewal. So if you're able, please take a seat as he comes up. You know, some of these songs that we sing, uh, we sing some really big things about God. Um, And I can't help but be uh, exposed and be confronted by these truths that we sing of God's beauty, about his ability to perform miracles. And reflecting upon my life, uh, do I really live out uh, these truths that we sing? Or we sing about his power, his goodness, his justice, his love, his beauty. Uh, But we often just glance at his beauty and behold other things in this world for our worth and for our significance. And so we live in this tension of knowing what we should do, but we often fail to do it. And the things that we know we shouldn't do, we are actually prone to do it. And so this time of renewal is an opportunity for us to bring these things before God, to confess that we actually do trust in ourselves more than we trust in him, uh, that we trust in other people and other things more than him. And and this is an exercise for us to draw near to God. Uh, This is a life-giving exercise of confessing our sins. So I want to invite us now to take these next few moments of silence uh, to confess our sins together. Let's pray. Church now receive their uh, words of assurance from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Amen. This idea of being justified is just as if I have not sinned. And so unlike some of our relationships, God does not hang our sins over us. He doesn't accuse us. He doesn't shame us. There is real freedom when we bring our sins before God. He forgives us faithfully. If you're able, if you can stand with me as we confess uh, together the Apostles' Creed. And this creed is uh, our summary statements of what Christians have believed for centuries, and this is what brings us together, and this is what makes us the church. So let's read, uh, read this together in one voice. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing together.
At this time, we're going to bring up Jason to give the announcements. All right. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Citizens. My name is Jason. I have the privilege of serving as the pastor here at the church. Um, just want to get to a few uh, announcements before we get into the word today. Uh, our first announcement is um, on Sunday, August 7th, we're having a community, uh, community group orientation. Um, uh, for those of you uh, who are new to our community, uh, new to our church and you are interested in joining a community group that's probably the question we get the most um, how do I uh, join a community group um, especially I think if you come on a Sunday uh, it can feel a little bit overwhelming um, you know getting to know people and so community groups are a great way to do life on life with a smaller group of people and so we have an uh, orientation where basically you're going to learn a little bit more about the vision and values of community group, what, what the structure of our community groups look like, uh, what to expect. And so we're going to ask uh, even those of you who are already in a community group, as well as those of you interested in joining uh, community groups in the fall, to come to this orientation. And part of the reason we're asking you to do that is because... Uh, even for those of you who are currently in community groups, there are a lot of changes coming up in terms of kind of how we're going to structure and how we're going to, um, as a church, think about our community groups moving forward. And so um, please RSVP for that if you're even a little bit interested in joining one or you're in a community group. So August 7th, that's going to happen right after the service at noon. And then there's also going to be a virtual option uh, offered on August 14th for those of you who can't make it um, on the 7th, okay? Uh, next, and I'm going to give you a, an opportunity to, to be able to uh, RSVP for all these announcements at the end of our announcement time, okay? Uh, second is uh, uh, in the month of August, on Tuesday nights at 7 to 9, for the first four Tuesdays in the month of August, we're actually uh, doing uh, an Enneagram course, an Enneagram uh, learning group, um, we already have 30 people signed up for it, so I guess it's something that our church is really interested in. Um, the thing is, is we could really use some more brothers in the group. Um, there's a lot of sisters, and, uh, you know, uh, not that that's bad, but I think brothers need self-examination too. So uh, if, if you're interested in this, you know, a really great uh, tool for relationships, uh, for just your own personal self-awareness uh, in our discipleship to Jesus, you know, because I think, you know, we always talk about what does it mean to love God with all, all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and how do we love neighbor as self? But so many of us um, don't even know kind of who we are, and the Enneagram is a helpful tool uh, to help us learn a little bit more about who we are. And so uh, would, we have a few slots left, so we would really encourage you uh, to sign up for that. Uh, next is um, next Sunday, um, as we do on the last Sunday of every month, we have a newcomer's luncheon. Um, especially we're in a season right now at our church where we are, uh, we are getting a lot of newcomers, meeting a lot of new people. Um, I see a lot of new faces every week. And so at the end of every month on Sunday, we have something called a newcomer's luncheon where we basically go out to eat somewhere and everyone is invited if you're new visiting for the first time or you've been here for a few months but you haven't really gotten a chance to get to know anyone or get plugged into the community um, we all meet outside under the tree there's a sign that says newcomers luncheon and depending on how big the size of the group is we'll kind of choose a place that can accommodate us but it's been really great uh, to just sit with uh, some of you and get to know a little bit more about your story in that more intimate setting. And so uh, if you or anyone you know is new or we're going to be visiting for the first time next week, uh, that's going to happen uh, right after the service uh, next Sunday, July 31st. Okay. Uh, lastly, I have just a few quick logistical announcements. Uh, if you're a parent and uh, you have uh, kids, you know, as you know, we kind of over the summer have changed a little bit of our format for children's ministry. Um, normally on Sundays we have a music program for our kids that happens in the library. There is no music program today, but we do have activities there for your kids. So uh, the only thing is if you're a parent with a child three or under, we ask that you accompany your kids there. 
but uh, you can go ahead and head over to the library, um, and we have a, a lot of activities there for you. Uh, second kind of logistical announcement, again, as always, after the service, if you could help us out, uh, uh, it, would, it would help our hospitality team out greatly if you could just grab the chair you're sitting on or see a few empty chairs around you and stack them uh, on the racks to my right and to my left. Um, and then uh, finally, the, j just the last kind of uh, logistical announcement is uh, people have been asking questions. You know, as you know, uh, there's been kind of a recent COVID surge in our city and LA, I know right now, is talking about potentially um, bringing back the indoor mask mandate on July 29th. And so please be on the lookout for our mailing list if um, that mask mandate does indeed happen. Um, our policy has been that we follow our LA County uh, health guidelines. And so you'll get an email this week, uh, potentially for next Sunday. And so, man, this, this pandemic is just not ending. And, uh, but, you know, hopefully uh, you're staying safe. Uh, I know that a lot of people, even in our community, are getting COVID right now for the first time. And so uh, please keep them in your prayers as well. Okay. Uh, well, that's the last kind of uh, announcement that I have, and uh, I have one more really big, important announcement. I'm going to invite our sister, uh, Elizabeth Hogston, up to the stage. Um, you can give her a round of applause. <laughs> um, uh, many of you know, uh, last fall, uh, Elizabeth uh, came to our church uh, as part of uh, her completing her ministry internship at Fuller Theological Seminary. She just recently graduated, uh, and um, yes, love it, love it. Um, and, you know, uh, to be honest, uh, it was the first time hosting uh, an internship for our church, and so there was a lot of uh, there are a lot of uncertainty and questions around whether or not uh, this was going to be, what kind of fit this was going to be. And needless to say, I mean, you've seen her on this pulpit over this past year. And I know that I speak for so many in our community and definitely our staff when I say that Elizabeth has become uh, truly a part of our family. Um, we are so grateful for um, the gift that she's been to this community uh, in the past year, um, the ways that she has uh, used her voice uh, from this pulpit, leading a community group, leading our college ministry in so many ways, really in that short amount of time, kind of making her imprint on this community. And so it's kind of a bittersweet uh, moment for us. I can't believe it's uh, almost, uh, almost a year has passed already, but Elizabeth was recently awarded a preaching fellowship uh, where she's going to literally be going to South Africa uh, in two days. And, uh, um, you know, and so uh, upon returning, she's now going to per pursue ordination, which we're really excited about. And, you know, uh, as someone, I can say that as someone who grew up um, in a church where I only sat under uh, male preaching, um, I can say that um, this past year, I know that even myself, um, I have benefited so much um, from sitting under Elizabeth's preaching. Uh, we're about a few months removed from our series through the book of Ruth, but I still hear people talk about Elizabeth's Ruth 1 sermon as being one of the most impactful sermons uh, they've ever heard in their lives. And so, um, needless to say, we are so grateful for Elizabeth. I uh, wanted to allow her to give, say a few words. I know she probably has a lot she could say to our congregation, but I'll, I'll hand over the mic to her. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say how grateful I am to have been able to serve here the past year. And uh, most of you probably don't know, but I came into this internship in a very broken place. Actually, it's my first time serving in a church um, in several years because of like a bad church experience I had a few years back. And so um, this was a very healing time for me. And I'm just really thankful for all the relationships I got to form with so many of you and um, just for so many things that I learned from Jason and the staff. And yeah, I'm really gonna miss you guys. So. Um, and so at, the, you know, at this time, if you could join me in prayer, we just wanna bless Elizabeth, celebrate her and pray for her uh, as we send her off as a church. Lord, we thank you 
uh, for your grace and your mercy and your continued faithfulness in our lives in the ways that you use uh, even the messy parts of our lives the broken parts of our lives uh, the ways that you redeem it the ways that you heal us uh, the ways that um, you will continue to remind us that you will never leave us or forsake us we thank you so much for our sister Elizabeth we thank you for the ways that you've crafted her in her image we thank uh, in your image we thank you uh, for her unique voice that has meant so much to this community um, in this season. Uh, we thank you uh, just for the humility, um, for the vulnerability that she models for us. And we thank you for the power that you've given uh, her in her voice, in her teaching, in her presence. And I just pray um, in anticipation uh, for what you're gonna continue to do uh, in her life, through her life, through her story. God, we ask for your covering uh, over her. We ask that you watch every step of her journey, which we believe is just beginning. We pray for your continued grace. We pray for strength. We pray um, that her heart would continue to grow uh, for your people, for your kingdom. And, uh, you know, as, as bittersweet as this moment is, we're so excited um, for all those who will continue to be blessed by Elizabeth's story and her life. We thank you so much uh, for this sister. We thank you, God, um, for your uh, continued work in her. And we pray that as a church, uh, we would continue to lift her up in prayer, that even now as we bless her, uh, we pray that uh, we would send her off uh, with encouragement and that she would know that um, she always has a home here at Citizens. We thank you so much. We pray all this in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's give her one more round of applause. All right. Um, well, at this time, now we want to continue our worship with our time of giving, uh, giving our tithes and offering. Uh, you know, we don't believe this is just an add-on to our worship service. We incorporate this time into the rhythm of our worship uh, because we believe it is an act of worship. It's an opportunity for us to respond to who God is and what he's done. And so you'll see a number you can text on the screen behind me. Uh, if you're joining us online, you can click the link um, or you can go to our Instagram page, click the, click the link tree and you'll see a link to our giving page there. Uh, let's just take a few moments to give. All right. Uh, well, now I have the great privilege of introducing our final guest speaker for our City Partnerships Month, which uh, we started this year as an opportunity for us to connect uh, with some of the organizations and initiatives we've partnered with in our city. As you know, uh, a big part of our vision here at Citizens is to be more planted in our city, to not just come and inhabit a space and then kind of go to our separate, go back to our separate lives, but to kind of open our eyes to see the work, the great work God is already doing um, in the city of LA. We've heard from uh, representatives from LA Mission, uh, we've heard from uh, Dennis at Lincoln Heights Tutorial Program. Last week, we heard from Sarah at As We Dwell. And finally, um, today we're going to hear from our brother, Pastor Len Tang, who is the lead pastor of Missio Community Church and the director of Fuller's Church Planting Initiative. Uh, those of you who've been a part of Citizens from the beginning knows uh, that we have a huge heart for church planting. Uh, we've been supporting uh, Fuller Church Planting Initiative ever since we launched, officially launched as a church. Um, and uh, many of you don't know this, but Len was at my or own ordination installation service. He's been such a huge mentor and friend uh, in my life. He was actually a part 
of the entire decision-making process uh, when I uh, when Carol and I decided to step into this role and so he's kind of uh, had a you know first-hand look at the entire journey and so it's been such a blessing to continue to partner with him um, in, in his work of raising up church planters um, they say that you can never have uh, enough churches and so our hope uh, as a church as we continue to mature and grow um, as a community is not to just grow bigger this way but to really begin to plant out um, to see the work God, the great work God is doing in all the different pockets in our city to see contextualized uh, ministry happen there are just so many needs uh, in our city so many people who need to experience and see and hear uh, hear the embodied gospel and so um, if you would join me uh, in welcoming Len uh, to the stage who's going to preach God's word for us today well it's a joy and uh and a privilege to be among you. And uh, I count Jason as a good friend. And it was really, it has been a privilege to kind of walk with him and to see what God has been doing in your midst as, as a church body. And even to think back to the vision you had for a very holistic ministry when you were thinking about planting back then as well. And one, one thing that strikes me that I want to commend to you as a congregation is that in the leaders I interact with, Jason strikes me as a rarity, a humble senior leader. And in a time when our trust in institutions is so broken, I think that's an amazing gift. And I pray that, uh, that God would continue to, to um, use you kind of out of a place of humility and vulnerability. So thank you. Well, um, today I'm going to read um, an extended passage from the book of Acts. It's Acts chapter 10. And uh, so sit back and relax as you kind of hear this extended narrative of the, the uh, encounter between the Apostle Peter and Cornelius. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who's called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped by the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius, the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had gathered uh, together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said, I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law 
for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He is a guest in the house of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. This passage is one of those stories that's kind of inherently powerful and almost functions like its own sermon. Unfortunately, I'm still going to preach a sermon about it, but I love this passage because it's full of surprises. The first surprise is that my colleague, my, my friend Johnny Ramirez Johnson, who teaches at Fuller, he points out that the Holy Spirit has the audacity to reach out to this Gentile Cornelius without first checking it out and clearing it with Peter and the other church leaders. It's like the Holy Spirit does stuff that the church is not prepared to do and hasn't given permission to do. Okay, that's pretty strange. It's, it's very disruptive when God doesn't follow our script. I'm, I'm Presbyterians, and we Presbyterians like to do things, as they say, decently and in order. And <clears throat> the Spirit of God giving a vision through an angel to a Gentile is definitely out of order, right? It's just not how we do things, the early church would have said. After all, Cornelius, as you know, was a Roman centurion, right? As in the most visible symbol of the occupying military force of Rome, right? He was a, like the representative of oppression, right? But no one told God that he wasn't supposed to be working in the lives of unbelievers, right? God was drawing Cornelius to himself. And in fact, Cornelius is described as being a God-fearer, meaning a, a non-Jew, a Gentile, who was beginning to follow the God of Israel. And his family was devout, and they gave, and they prayed. He was beginning to seek the God of Israel. And I'm, um, I don't know about you, but I'm always surprised how much God is at work in the lives of unbelievers around me. I forget that he actually can do that, that the church doesn't have a corner on the work of God in the world, but that all the people in our lives, God is wooing, right? He's, he's at work in them just like he's at work in us. We may not be aware of it, and they might, may not be aware of it. I even think about my own story and testimony that I was an agnostic slash atheist in high school. I thought that Christianity was a crutch for weak or stupid people. That's honestly what I thought. And, um, and it was actually through the kindness of my wrestling teammate, Gabe, who was not a Christian himself, but he was a really good person and I wanted to be a good person. And that was actually part of an initial catalyst to me later coming to faith. And I think we can be aware, we can be cognizant of the fact that God is working in all kinds of ways in the lives of our friends and family and culture if we would only be attentive to it. 
Just a few weeks ago, through a mutual friend, a guy named Tom started attending our church. And Tom is really actively seeking, partially because he was humbled in life and because his teenage daughter is struggling right now. And Tom is kind of beginning to pursue faith. And so I gave him a copy of the Gospels and he read that in a week and then we met the next week. And he began to show me things about the love of God that, were, that helped me grow. He said, you know, I, I, I would give my life for my daughter in a heartbeat. He said, there's nothing I wouldn't do for my child. But I can't imagine what it would be like to give up my daughter to death for some cause. And so he was blown away by the love of God who would give his only son for our sake. And he shed new light on the gospel, on the love of God, because God's working in his life. And I think he's working in the lives of so many that we, we need to be attentive to. So God's working in Cornelius, and Peter is very slow to come to realize that. Uh, God sends this angel to Cornelius, but the interesting thing is that the angel doesn't tell him about Jesus. In fact, nowhere in Scripture do angels tell people about Jesus. The angel directs him to Peter, who tells him about Jesus. The gospel is always conveyed through human beings. For some reason, he chooses us as that vehicle of, of communication. So every one of you who's here today is here because someone embodied Jesus Christ to you and told you in some sense, either by how they lived or what they said or both. I was led to Christ as a freshman at Berkeley because three different Christians came to campus to share their gospel with this semi-hostile uh, freshman. So there might be a Len Tang or a Cornelius in your life whom God is already at work in and that he wants to use a human messenger like you to convey the good news. Now, in our story today, the angel says, go get this guy, Peter, who, who's staying 30 miles away in the city of Joppa, right? And you can't just, like, Uber there. So, like, the, he sends three guys to walk 30 miles to go, to go get him. And it's pretty interesting that when the angel tells him to do it, Cornelius does it. I'm not actually sure that if I were him that I'd do it, because it's like, that sounds pretty crazy and is like a bad use of resources, right? So, but he sends him, he goes sends the guys there. And just to zoom out for a minute, you know, scholars think that this passage in Acts 10 takes place about a decade after the resurrection of Jesus. A decade. Okay, so that means that this whole time, the early church and the, 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 the Jerusalem leaders like Peter are not sharing the gospel overtly with non-Jews. They're, they're telling their Jewish friends about Jesus but they're not actually any closer to, you know, wanting, wanting Gentiles to come to faith than, like, Republicans and de Democrats are to want to partner with each other today, right? They were just completely separate worlds. The, 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 the church in Jerusalem never had a invite your Gentile friend to church Sunday, right? Because they didn't have any Gentile friends. It was like that was a big faux pas. They still were separated from each other, even though the gospel had come to them and Jesus had been raised from the dead. It would like take a miracle to get a Jew and Gentile in the same room. And that's exactly what Acts 10 is. It's a miracle that put these two groups that were formerly hostile in the same place. God invites Peter, uh, God woos this unbeliever to bring Peter the believer to join an episode that's already in progress. You know, in my work at Fuller, we talk a lot about the missio dei, which is this Latin phrase, which means the mission of God. It's the idea that God has a missionary heart, and all throughout Scripture, God has been drawing people to himself by pursuing them, that God is on a search and rescue mission, right, and that he's sent his church to be his representatives. And so the church's self-understanding is as a sent people, Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. It's one of those sort of foundational verses because it tells us that God is a, a God who modeled coming from heaven to earth for us and then a God who then sends us into our context to be his hands and feet, to live on mission and to do it in an incarnational way. And over time, you know, 
many missionaries and theologians like Leslie Newbegin and David Bosch and Christopher Wright and others have helped many in the church to rediscover this sense, this biblical truth that mission is a part of God's nature. It's not just like an activity you do on Tuesday nights to uh, go serve the homeless. Mission is actually part of who God is. And so if we're becoming like God, mission is going to become more a part of our lives. So Jesus is sending his followers, the body of Christ, to this lost and broken world. And we could even go all the way back to Abraham in Genesis 12, where, you know, it wasn't Abraham was like, hey, honey, let's go on vacation to Canaan. That was like the last thing on their minds. But God sent them to an unknown place. And he became, through that, he became the father of many nations. And through him, the whole world was blessed. Or we might think about how God sent the former murderer Moses to be the deliverer of God's people in slavery in Egypt, or how he chose David as the youngest son to become king and to unite Israel, or the prophets to speak to Israel even though they were deaf. God is always sending people, and then ultimately he sent his son Jesus Christ, right? God is ascending God. And so Acts 10 is the latest in this whole line of missional passages and missional theology that could be an organizing principle for the whole of scripture. But back to our story. So God sends, sends a DM to Cornelius, and then he sends one to, to Peter so the two of them can meet up, right? At noon, Peter has this bizarre vision, kind of almost like a nightmare for a Jew, where this sheet comes down, and he sees all these animals crawling around on him, and God tells him to kill and eat them. And Peter, like any Jew, is like, no way, Lord, I've never eaten those things, and I never will, because that was really part of the Jewish dietary uh, law. But the vision happens not once, not twice, but three times. And have you ever noticed that when God is trying to get a hold of you, he like whacks you on the head many times with the two by four? That's what it took for Peter to kind of get the message through his thick skull because it broke all his understandings as a good Jew. But God was doing something new. And when these guys show up at his door, he sort of begins to thaw out a little bit. The Spirit tells them, don't hesitate to go with them, for I've sent them. And it says that Peter invited the men in his house to be his guests. You might think that's not really a big deal, but again, this is the first crack. For a Jew to invite Gentiles into their home was, again, like, kind of like the eating food. You're not supposed to do that. Big faux pas. But Peter's starting to think, okay, I think the Holy Spirit is doing something new. I better get on board. And so... <clears throat> One of the signs that God is at work in our lives is when we, we invite the other into our home, to our guests. The people that we invite to dinner who are different than us are signs of the Spirit of God at work in our lives. So I wonder who's, who's sort of an unexpected guest that has been in our home who maybe looks different than us and is unexpected. So anyway, this mixed group of people, Christians and Gentiles, they, they walk the 30 miles together back to Caesarea and they arrive the next day, and his, he's, got, he's kind of like got the revival tent ready. They're all, they're all there, his family and his friends. They're ready to hear what Peter has to say. And then Peter takes his next big step, literally. He sets foot in the home of a Gentile, which was an even bigger deal than having Gentiles set foot in his home. And he, and he thanks them for their hospitality by saying, you know, I shouldn't even be here and associate with your kind. That's kind of his uh, introductory statement. But following God's lead puts us in unexpected places with unexpected people. There's a church planter named Esteban who's um, in the, the church planting cohort, cohort that I help lead at Fuller. And he's planting a church in Moreno Valley in, in Riverside County. And he had planned to start a Spanish-speaking service at a community center there in the area. But the strange thing is that these um, English-speaking folks kept showing up and asking for prayer. Like they would just show up at the community center, kind of wander in and say, I'm, I'm struggling, I need prayer. And so in response to what God was doing, he shifted and now all their services are in English rather than Spanish. He had totally had to pivot because God was doing a new thing in their midst. All the time, I think you and I need to be ready to adapt to what God is doing, because Peter didn't plan to start a Gentile house church that day, but that's what happened, right? 
In fact, what he ne says next is really cool, another surprise. He says, God has shown me I should not call anyone impure or un unclean. It's kind of like, okay, he got the whole vision with the sheet. It's like supposed to mean for all you, you Gentiles. Okay, I'm supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to separate myself. Again, he's the leader of the church 10 years after the resurrection, and it's just starting to sink in. And then he sh shares another revelation. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Peter's realizing that the gospel is a lot bigger than he ever realized. It included a lot of others that he had excluded before. He hadn't gotten that. So first, you know, in Acts, Saul, the persecutor of the church, got saved. Now this Roman centurion, who's next? You know, when I, when I think about what's happening in our culture today, I think God's people have been realizing afresh that we, there's, a, there's groups of people that we've been thinking of as impure and unclean, in a sense. It took the threefold vision of the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd to help the Church of Jesus Christ awaken to the fact that we have been treating African Americans as impure and unclean, even within the church, right? So many of us in the evangelical church were blind to that or complicit in, in that. And it took these secular events to awaken us to the fact of our need to repent, right? That God, if we say that God loves all people, he doesn't show favoritism, but we're showing favoritism in the way we do church and in the way that we run our schools and make budgets, then we are showing favoritism. And so I think God can use all different kinds of people and secular events to awaken us to what he's doing. So once Peter has genuine respect for his audience, he then goes on to the main message about preaching about Jesus. And he does do that. But he doesn't, I think what's important here is he, he preaches about Jesus, but the things that got him there to preach Jesus, to invite the Gentiles into his home, to step into their home, those were the, those were the building blocks. Those were the bridges that made the message make sense and be credible. And so when he preached about Jesus, they were responsive. Their hearts were open. They were ready. And so he tells them about Jesus' baptism and his healings and his death on his cross and his resurrection. And, he, and at the end, he says, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And I don't think Peter had actually understood before that day that everyone meant everyone. And then the funny thing is Peter doesn't get to finish his sermon because it says the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message and the Christians there were blown away because all these Gentiles were like speaking in tongues and having a powerful Holy Spirit experience. So they're finally convinced. And again, Peter does on that day what he never imagined. He, ba he baptized this whole household of Gentile believers and welcomed them as full members of the church. So this story is not the story of the, just, just about the story of, of Cornelius' conversion. This story is Peter's conversion to the fullness of the gospel. Because when we join God's mission in the world, it transforms all of us, those who are ministering to and those who are doing the ministering. And the great thing about joining God's mission is it doesn't require a pulpit or a seminary degree or a building or a budget. It just requires being attentive to what God is doing in the context that he's placed you and me in. This is a mission he's given to all of us that we all get to play. That God is looking for people who are willing to follow him across boundaries, right? He, Peter, Peter had to go walk the 30 miles, yeah, and he had to step into a house that he never had before. But what I love is, particularly in working among church planters, and and I think all of us, in a sense, are called to be church planters, right? To bring the gospel and to help build, begin new communities of faith. I see people, I, I get the privilege of hearing the stories of people who are crossing boundaries. That my friend Sarah in the San Francisco Bay Area, that she uh, is a stay-at-home mom who felt this burden for an apartment complex of underserved folks very, very near her home. 
And it turns out she's fluent in Spanish. And so she, as a, someone who is a half Central American, could connect, she looks like and connects with a lot of the families in this, this uh, housing complex. And so she sort of accidentally is planting a church there. And she literally speaks their language. She also speaks French, which some of the Algerian immigrants do as well. And so the unique aspects of her life are coming together to be a messenger of the good news um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Or Martin is a medical doctor in Uganda who's also part of our, our cohort. And he's thinking about planting a church in Houston, Texas, of all places. But Houston actually has the largest medical complex in the world. So maybe he's gonna find a place there. Or Liz is a retired Catholic woman with a heart to start a ministry among the unhoused in um, Leicester, England. All these interesting array of people around the world who are following God's call, crossing boundaries in these strange places and, and contexts. And so you can see why church planting is, is often called the R&D wing of the church, because there are people who are sort of breaking new ground and tilling the soil so that they can tell the rest of us, the Peters, like, hey, it's all right. The water's good. Come on in. And it's something that's available to, to all of us, that this work of joining God's mission is, is actually best done as a team sport, that all of you in your context can help one another in your community groups. You might prayer walk your, your neighborhood and try and discern what God is doing. You might look for what um, many church planters call a person of peace, which is in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out the disciples two by two and says, when you go to a house, say, peace be on this house. And if, your peace, if they receive that, stay with them. And so what we teach church planters is be alert to the person of peace. Who's that person who's not a follower of Jesus but is open to you and, and opens the doors for you to set foot in a new people group? I remember when we started our church, Missio, we, were, we wanted to reach out to Caltech students, these really, really bright but extremely uh, materialistic, I mean, in the sense that they only believed in the material world, uh, folks. And right at that same time, I was having a conversation with a friend who had come to faith through science and faith conversations. And we, we kind of realized, oh my gosh, Fuller Seminary is, giving a, is administering a grant to do science and faith integration for young adults. We should apply for that. So we asked the student leaders at Caltech, would you want to partner with us on this grant? And they said yes. And that's what kind of launched us in our ministry, is running these, these uh, events on the Caltech campus that invited a Christian to, to, we had dinner, and then the Christian would give a talk, and we'd have Q&A and then table discussion around what it meant to integrate science and faith on a very, very secular campus. And so what the Fuller Church Planning Initiative, that's part of my privilege, is to sort of hear and tell stories of people who are breaking new ground for the gospel. We get to do that with, with, with church planters themselves and, and to equip them through a, a digital platform and a church planting certificate that we developed. But we also have the privilege of being a force multiplier, meaning that we get to use Fuller's convening power to gather church planting leaders who are overseeing their own church planters and equip them with the tools that they need. What a privilege it is to kind of from my little, um, I still work from home, so from my little bedroom in Pasadena, to get to interact with leaders like Chris Swan, who leads City to City Australia, which is the church planting wing in Australia of um, Tim Keller's City to City church planting ministry. And they, they, they're, they found a lot of fruit from using this church planting certificate that they developed in Australia. But then they said, we'd like to actually make it more for our context. And so we're, this summer, we're developing a customized version for Australia and New Zealand that will feature some of their planters and their stories and their context. So it's going to be more effective. Every one of us is placed in a particular context. And the good news is going to manifest itself through who you are and, and who God has uh, made your story out to be. So I'm excited for your future together as a, as a church that's, that's supportive of church planting and that has a pastor who thought about church planting, that some of that DNA will continue to seep in and through all of you individually, through your families, through your community groups, and through you corporately. Because the good news is that Jesus isn't done converting us. There's more to the gospel than we realize. 
And when we join him on mission, the gospel gets bigger for us. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you give us the privilege of not only being rescued and saved by Jesus, but by including us, by letting us participate in your mission in the world. And so I pray, Lord, for the Corneliuses in all of our lives, that, Lord, you would love them through us and that you would teach us through them and that they and us would fall to our knees and call more fully on the name of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, can we give Len a, a huge round of applause? Uh, as we've been doing each week, we have an opportunity as a church to bless um, our guest speakers and the great uh, work that they're doing, um, and that God is doing in them and through uh, their respective initiatives and organizations. So would you bow with me one more time uh, as we bless our brother Len? Gracious God, we thank you um, for our brother Len. We thank you for the words that... Um, this morning remind us that, um, you know, oftentimes the church feels like we need a mission, but we're reminded today that no, um, that your mission needs a church, that you are already at work in the world in ways both seen and unseen in our workplaces, in our homes, in our schools, that if we would just become attentive, if we would just open our eyes that our hearts would be open to see those in need uh, all around us, those who've been entrusted to our care, uh, that we would see that there is so much work um, that you're already doing and work that we can be involved in uh, as followers of Jesus. And so, God, uh, we just continue to pray for Len and the work that he's doing, uh, not only at Missio Community Church, uh, but also through the Fuller Church Planting Initiative, equipping and empowering uh, young leaders as they discern uh, in their respective contexts uh, how they can be involved and how they can join uh, in your work of making all things new in our world. God, I just pray for uh, continued strength. I pray for protection over uh, Len and his family. Uh, and we just pray, God, that you would continue to give us a bigger vision for our lives. So, so many times, Lord, we, uh, so much of life is just the rat race, the nine to five, um, just kind of surviving, uh, not realizing that you are at work in powerful ways that if we would simply just see if we would just simply ask, that we would just simply take the time and create space to discern that there is so much uh, that, that we can be a part of um, because of the ways that you've uniquely crafted us uh, in your image, the ways that the, the specific experiences that you've given us, our wiring, our relationships. God, help us to see uh, how we can join you uh, in your vision, in your mission. We thank you so much for this time, for this word. Uh, we lift Len up to you. We lift uh, his ministry up to you. We lift his family up to you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, amen. At this time, I'm going to invite us to stand, if you're able, as we respond uh, to the word today uh, with a song of praise. Let's worship together.
Now receive this blessing, that a God who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine according to his power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church, in the world, and in Christ Jesus. Amen.